Nearly a million African Americans participated in World War II, but no one put out a welcome mat. The military's attitude was one of, do we really have to? The 761 Black Panthers turned the corner for the Allies in the Battle of the Bulge, despite popular opinion. The public said that the black didn't have brains enough to serve in combat. The Tuskegee Airmen helped win the war in the skies over Germany, but they had to fight two battles. Victory against Hitler in Europe and victory against racism here at home. The only unit of African-American women sent overseas, the 6888 Central Postal Battalion, tackled millions of pieces of mail to get them to servicemen all over Europe. These women improve the morale. Wounded medic Waverly Woodson treated hundreds of fallen troops on D-Day's Omaha Beach, but he never got the Medal of Honor he deserves. This was an awful stain on our military, the failure to uh, recognize heroism of African Americans. Up next, we salute these brave men and women who suffered the injustices of serving while black. Millions of people come here every year to this place of remembrance, right in the heart of the Washington Mall. Hi, I'm Angela Stribling, and what better place to honor the nearly two million African Americans who served than at the World War II Memorial? These often forgotten men and women were almost never seen or mentioned when the news was reported, the history books written, the movies made, yet many performed with bravery and distinction. And we hope to correct that record by bringing you some stories of serving while black. Tuskegee Airman Brigadier General Charles Edward McGee flew 409 combat missions. And he is still flying high, prepping to pilot a personal jet just one day shy of his 100th birthday. You'll be in the captain's seat. Wow. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> when folks ask me now, I say, really, I was avoiding the draft. <laughs> Quick look at the engine, it's uh, clear, exactly. clear, the back, the exhaust is clear as well. Yeah. All I can say is after my first flight in that PT-17, I was hooked. <laughs> there are just some things you don't forget, and uh, to be able to take a hold of the stick, it, it's a thrill. This flight ranks as a well-earned thrill ride and just one of many amazing moments in a life he never could have imagined. I was able to actively fly 27 of my 30 years of service, so I was having the ball all the way. The all-black Tuskegee Air Program was never supposed to take off. An intervention by First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt got it off the ground, overcoming a 1925 study by the Army War College that influenced African-American recruitment for decades. Paragraph three of that two-page study uh, said the Negro was physically qualified, the Negro was mentally inferior to the white man, the Negro is morally inferior to the white man, the Negro can't stand up under tough circumstances. And what followed was, oh, service road, dig ditches, cook food, build roads, and drive trucks, but do anything technical like maintain flying airplane, impossible. But wartime demand for increased manpower forced the armed services to expand their numbers. And so they began the experiment known as the Tuskegee Airmen. The Army said, well, we, we studied the issue, we know it's going to fail but we'll authorize the A squadron. They changed jobs, they changed clothes, they took a train into the future. The Army enlisted nearly 900 recruits for the mission and trained them in separate but equal facilities required by Jim Crow laws. Once given the opportunity, our experience dispelled the biases and generalizations and, and, yes, sometimes racist ideas that the black was a second-class citizen. Despite resistance by white officers to command black soldiers, 
The airmen eventually headed overseas. McGee landed in Italy in early 1944. When their assignments moved to German skies, the Tuskegee Airmen took on a new role. They realized that our bombers needed escort protection from the German fighters. The escort workers began to save American lives as well as allow the freedom of the bombers to destroy Germany's war-making potential. And that became a part of the Tuskegee Airmen story, if you will. In 1948, President Harry Truman officially ended segregation in the armed forces with an executive order, opening up better opportunities for servicemen of color. McGee went on to serve in Korea and Vietnam, always racking up record numbers of flights. I never got a scratch. <laughs> Had one victory uh, during that flying. I did get hit, but fortunately it was out in the wing, not the cockpit. These four prints are called the Fredericksburg prints because the artist in Fredericksburg, Virginia, depicts the four single-engine fighter squadrons of the 332nd Fighter Group. McGee remembers his past exploits and takes pride in what the Tuskegee Airmen accomplish. We were there to help save American lives, and that we did. And and, and that helped pay off. Hey, Cole, are you to plan on going to Mars? <laughs> yeah, right. Often a featured speaker at veterans' events like this one, at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, Colonel McGee continues to serve his country. Thank you so much. The chance to share his story with young audiences remains a driving force in a long, well-lived life. The young folks are our future, and so we need to keep them oriented and going in the right direction. We need to be about, hopefully, inspiring them. And when Serving While Black returns, we salute the only African-American women's battalion that served overseas in World War II. World War II saw the largest use of African-American women up to that time. So what we saw is, is black women who received training as mechanics, as male clerks. I mean, you could run the gamut. There can be no doubt that however reluctant the forces were to create great opportunities, the need of the country required a greater use of African-Americans. Only one group of black women was sent into the war zone. After a rigorous training process, the 800 plus members of the 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion boarded ships bound for the British Isles in February of 1945. Oh, this is our most of commanding officer, who is General Lee. At age 97, Indiana Hunt Martin enjoys looking back on her days as a whack. She is one of eight surviving members of her unit. Their mission? To combat sinking morale by sorting through a two to three year backlog of mail that was not reaching soldiers all over the European continent. When they showed us the piles and piles of junk of mail that we had to work on, oh God, it was a mess. Their headquarters was an abandoned schoolhouse in Birmingham, England, where danger never seemed far away. We were bombing London bad, and we could see it. But they didn't ever bomb down where we were. We were worried about it, but we didn't get it. Thank you so very much for coming. Um, I'll talk about the documentary first to put it in context of what you're about to watch. When retired Colonel Edna Cummings learned about the 6888, she knew she had to tell their story of no mail, no morale. So she became part of the production team for a documentary on these brave, unheralded women. 
where we are attempting to educate and inform the public about the 6888. Their commander, Charity Adams Early, organized the operation to process the estimated 17 million pieces of mail with amazing precision. So she set up a shift system, 24 hour operations, approximately eight to 10 hours per shift. With this operation, they processed about 65,000 pieces of mail per shift. These women improved the morale and just was crucial to the overall attitude at the time. The women chipped away at the mountains of mail, making every effort to redirect the 7 million pieces of correspondence to soldiers who were missing their letters from home. The women had to work in blackout conditions. They had to wear extra clothing because there was no heat. So just austere wartime conditions. They could hear the bombs going off around them. The 6888 cleared the mail pile up in less than three months. From England, they traveled to Rouen, France to tackle another two million pieces of mail. When we unveil this monument, what we're really saying is this. Thank you for your service. At the end of November 2018, the Army unveiled a monument at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, dedicated to the 6888 Postal Battalion. Five of the original members attended. The women were credited with forever changing the United States Army for the better. The one thing that uplifts your spirit is your contact from a loved one, a friend, or anyone. That's what these women did for over seven million Americans. Next up on Serving While Black, the original Black Panthers come out fighting. Less than half a million veterans of the greatest generation are still alive today. One of our heroes, Thomas Mangrum, passed away recently, and we feel the loss. We are glad we got a chance to meet him and honored to share his story. No, I'm the honest one left, from what I understand. I'm the honest one out of 4,000 men. See, I'm 93. Uh, so far, with the search we did, we have come up with, with no other person but me. Thomas Mangrum was the last man standing from the first all-black armored unit to see combat in World War II. The famed Black Panthers Battalion would help turn the tide for the Allies. The main thing that the black soldiers try to prove to the white people they can do a job and do it better. Mangrum grew up in Newport News, Virginia one of nine in a family struggling to survive. My daddy worked in a shipyard here in Newport News. He worked one day a week, two days a week, and I was the oldest. And I had to work. I go to school, I could study. And then at nighttime, I go to Dawn Laundry there in Newport News and, uh, and clean up. So little wonder that he enlisted in the Army the day after high school graduation, fudging his age to the recruiter and forging his mother's signature. I was glad to get out and get something to eat. <laughs> Half the time, we didn't have no food at home to eat. And the army had three meals a day. And, uh, and I, 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 like, I, I like that. Mangrum found his niche in radio communications, operating a teletype machine like this one, a skill he learned from a neighbor when he was a Boy Scout. I learned code pretty, pretty well. And when I first went to the Army, they, uh, I took the test and I made 150. And they made me take it over again and I made 175. Reluctant to recruit African Americans, 
The armed services operated under strictly enforced Jim Crow standards, so Mangrum was assigned to an all-black unit. The public said that the black didn't have brains enough to serve in combat. Said they're going to fight and they're going to run. That didn't happen. Mangrum ran communications for the tank unit, laying down lines and reporting messages to his white commanders. But the 761 didn't see much action until the Germans handed the Allies some serious defeats. They didn't use the black soldier in the tanks at all until the German wiped out four of Penn battalion, wiped out completely. And then that's when Penn decided to go get the black. His aide was talking to him not to use those The people back home don't want in combat. Penn told him, I don't give a damn what color they are. I need some damn tankers. And next day, he came in, came in to see us, sit on top of a tank and said, I need tankers. I need somebody to kill these crowd. And I need y'all And he apologized, said color. I need y'all color guys to, uh, to help me win this war. During the brutal 39-day siege of the Battle of the Bulge, the men proved their worth and lived up to their battalion motto, come out fighting earning 391 battle awards, including 69 bronze stars. After he left the Army, Mangrum earned the Audie Murphy Award, the highest military award for bravery, while working on an OV-1 Mohawk aircraft. We're running, we're running a test on the, fir, on the gear, and it broke. And it turned the plane over, it caught a fire and I went out there and put the file and took the pilot out. Mangrum retired here on Gwynn's Island, Virginia, where he was elected a local official for 10 years. When the island decided to open a museum, he donated his awards to get it started. The most important principles of our Gwynn's Island Museum is preserving Matthews County and Winds Island history, as well as honoring the brave men and women who have served in the uh, veterans and of our services. We're proud to have Thomas's memorabilia here. Recognition for a forgotten hero when serving while black returns. No African-American who deserved the Medal of Honor for his service in World War II received it. Today we fill the gap in that picture. More than 50 years after the end of World War II, seven African-Americans who served in that conflict were awarded the military's highest honor for bravery, the Medal of Honor. Only one recipient was still alive to get his medal, Second Lieutenant Vernon Baker. His level of heroism had been something that you'd only see this side of a movie. To some extent, we know that that is a reflection of negative attitudes in the military establishment. On D-Day, only one unit of African Americans stormed the beaches of Normandy the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion. Their job was to launch low-altitude hydrogen-filled balloons over the Omaha Beach to protect the troops who were landing from strafing by enemy aircraft. Medic Waverly Woodson was assigned to the balloon unit and was headed ashore. Here is part of his eyewitness account of that fateful day read to us by his widow, Joanne Woodson. My witness to D-Day, June 6, 1944. D-Day was the most emotional and dangerous day in my life. The trip across the English Channel was rough, 
The waves were high and many of the troops were seasick and scared. 5 a.m., the sky in the distance lit up with searchlights, traces from ak ax and the sound of bombs. German batteries returned the fire, raking the ship's catwalk. Many seamen manning those guns were killed and hung over the catwalk, a horrible sight to see. Before he even stepped on the beach, he was wounded. A mortar shell killed the man standing next to him, and the shrapnel struck him in the back of his legs. He thought he was going to die, but after his wounds were dressed, he scrambled onto the beach. All day, we medics continued to dress many, many wounded and console the frightened. With all of this going on, I didn't have time to see how bad I was wounded. I only wanted to help the survivors. Woodson was awarded the Purple Heart and the Bronze Star for his bravery on Omaha Beach. His officers recommended him for higher honors, but the paperwork was lost in a fire. His army service preempted his dream of becoming a surgeon. Instead, he had a distinguished career at the National Institutes of Health, but no Medal of Honor ever came. I think that he should have been nominated for it long ago. He should have had it be even before he passed on, but he needs to have a legacy. Waverly Woodson returned to Normandy in 1994 at the invitation of the French government for the ceremonies surrounding the 50th anniversary of the invasion. He never dreamed that he would go back. We got to witness just exactly what D-Day was like. He said that sometimes you just didn't know how much more you could do for the wounded soldiers. They were just laying all over the place and they were just yelling, Doc, help me, help me. He said, some of them, you just had to give them the last rites. But it was very, very touching to sit and see him have to retell that. Recently, new references to Waverly's medal recommendations have come to light and petitions to have Woodson recognized have been led by Senator Chris Van Hollen. There's enough of a record of this recommendation that we think that this award uh, should now be presented, the Medal of Honor. After World War II, African American soldiers were not given the Medal of uh, Honor. This was an awful stain on our military, the failure to uh, recognize heroism of African Americans. He was an all round good person. And I really have been very proud to be his wife. It's been our privilege to share some of the many stories of serving while black. Waverly Woodson's Medal of Honor still awaits approval, but if you would like to help with the Congressional Medal of Honor for the women of the 6888, tell your members of Congress you support the bill that recognizes these pioneering ladies. For more information about African American service during World War II, go to our website. I'm Angela Stribling. Thanks for watching.